Good day and welcome to this week's Quick Take. Uh, I'm Howard Krieger, CEO of One Federal Reserve. Uh, if you have a moment and you like what you see here or some of our other videos, please like and subscribe below. Uh, I'm glad to have you. Uh, this week, I uh, want to discuss the bank, uh, let's get the name right here, the Bank Term Funding Program, the BTFP, which is the Emergency Credit Facility that the Federal Reserve has mustered, uh, with approval, of course, um, as a way to alleviate concerns around uh, the U.S. banking uh, system's liquidity. Um, as most folks are aware, and if you're watching this, then you're you're probably kind of interested in banking to begin with. Um, the uh, recent run on deposits, uh, and again, these aren't overnight everybody lining up and taking money out of banks, but but just the accelerated runoff of deposits due in part to higher costs of capital, uh, the impending recession that we hear about uh, causing a lot of startups and VCs and what have you to withdraw their deposits. Obviously, that's disproportionately hurt banks that are concentrated in those sectors like Silvergate Bank and Signature um, and... Uh, What's the other big one that uh, went under? So Silvergate, Signature, and Silicon Valley Bank. I know the three S's. Um, so we know there's been a disproportionate run on those deposits. That's caused uh, turmoil with respect to how the asset liability committees at those banks are managing the, the lowering and the length of time that those liabilities, those deposit liabilities are sitting there, um, forcing the banks, of course, to sell off some of their longer term paper. And as the Fed has been rising rates, causing this evacuation of the, the venture capital markets and startups, uh, the, the unrealized losses on the long term paper become realized losses. That, of course, hits equity, stock prices drop, People see that, they get scared for their bank's longevity, uh, and you get this kind of self-perpetuating cycle. Now, of course, uh, one easy fix, of course, is for the Fed to lower rates, raise the you know value of the long-term paper, let some of these banks kind of recalibrate. But, you know, the Fed isn't always making the, the most logical moves. I mean, that's that's just the unfortunate reality of, of, of the system. Um, but to that end, they did put out this facility, and uh, I thought, let's you know take a couple of minutes, run through it, uh, what it does, what it doesn't do, uh, and see if we can kind of make some hay. So we got a couple of documents we're going to go through. We're going to go through the press release that the Fed Reserve released. We're going to go through statements they made to to Congress, um, then the Fed's own announcement, uh, then. Uh, the terms and conditions of the facility, which is very interesting, uh, as well as some of the eligible uh, collateral that banks can use to access this. So re remember the idea here, right? So 10,000 foot view, this is always important, is always uh, take perspective here. So the, the issue at hand is that um, because of a deposit run, the concern from the Fed's perspective is that we're seeing the beginning of contagion or people like you and me um, and companies like me and you, if you own a company or run a company, uh, taking our deposits and, and basically either stuffing them in the mattress or maybe even moving up to like bigger banks uh, because we're concerned about the viability of, of like maybe the regional bank that, that we're using. Uh, this idea here is that if banks are able to repay their depositors um, without having to tap FDIC directly, uh, then um, a, uh, you know, the Fed's able to prop up regional banks, you know, in essence, not letting them fail. Uh, and also, you know, given a couple of months, the Fed's thinking this will just go away. There'll be some other news. There'll be something else that's crazy. And people will stop like taking their money out of like local bank one um, and and trying to go to like, you know, the chases and the B of A's of the world. So that's the idea here is, is essentially stop the headline risk of further bank collapses uh, due to these runs. Now, what remains to be seen, of course, is is this enough? Is is the backstop that that the Fed puts in place 
Um, what's the unintended consequence that comes from it or nothing, you know, is this just the fed printing more money and until again, the next crisis pops up. So let's take a look. Uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can see. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Boom, boom, boom. And to begin with, um, we are going to start with the press release, March 12th. That's like kind of right in the middle of the, of the nonsense here, post-bank collapse, um, right at the beginning to support American businesses and households. And remember what I've said before in all of these quick takes, the words that are chosen, these are not, this is not normal human beings writing these things. You know, these are, the, 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 this is a, a professional writer um, who is picking words and then giving them to attorneys uh, that then review them. And then of course, other, other high level policymakers probably get like a kiss at the pig here. But every word, the order of the words, what they say and what they don't say is extremely important to actually understand the crux. If you end up guessing, if you guess something that's not written here, then you're probably, you, you know, odd, odds are you, you're going to be off base. But right here, to support American businesses and households, right? So they're going right after businesses because, again, regional banks, here's, here's the thing, most um John Q and Jane Q public tend to bank at big banks because you get ATMs, you have the credit cards and the miles, and you have the, the mortgages and the 529s. And, and the big banks offer a slate of prod products and features, mobile banking, et cetera, that really appeal to the retail customer. But when you're a business, um, you have different needs. Maybe you don't need like a fancy UI or mobile app, but if you're a business, you need good business banking. You need, you know, wires that are reliable, uh, you want access to your banker for funding. You you, you want um, maybe payroll, maybe some tax and accounting support. You know, maybe some estate and gift support um, for uh, the owners of the business. So so business banking tends to be much different than retail banking, and and as a result, business banking tends to be more concentrated at regionals uh, than, like I said, the retails that you know are at making Super Bowl ads. So right there, going right at businesses first tells me that the Fed knows the problem isn't with the bigs, it's with banks ranked, you know, seven through 40. Um, and in the U.S., there's about 5,000 banks. Not all of them are FDIC insured, but there are about 5,000 registered banks in the U.S. So, th so there's a big population at risk here. Um, the Fed Reserve in, on Sunday, right, I work on the weekend, good to see, um, they'd make additional funding to eligible depository institutions uh, so in sh to assure banks have the ability to meet the needs of their depositors. Now, what's the need of the depositor? The need is to take in the money. Uh, this action will bolster the capacity to safeguard deposits uh, and ensure the ongoing provision of money and credit to the economy. So, so here, what's interesting is, on the one hand, the Fed is raising interest rates. Uh, in in a deliberate and purposeful attempt to slow down the economy, to almost cause layoffs, to stop spending, to stop the extension of credit from the banks to people. And right here, because of, of this kind of unintended consequence of the rate raises uh, and the long-term paper uh, you know, falling in, in value for these banks, uh, this is them like shimming up the other side of the table. So it's kind of like when you go to a restaurant, the table wobbles and you shove like a napkins under the one end. Well, it's like they did that. And then this other part of the table got wobbly. So rather than kind of undo the shimmying they did, they're just going to put more money over here, <laughs> uh, which I mean, that is a reaction. I don't know that that's the best reaction, but it's something, right? So the funds are going to be made available, offering loans of one year in length to banks, savings associations, credit unions, and other eligible depository institutions pledging treasuries, debt, and MBS and other qualifying assets. So this is the big, this is the, this is the meat and potatoes here, right? What, what Janet is saying is that, uh, I mean, Janet Yellen, of course, what Janet's saying here is that, uh, that it's a one-year loan to Eligible depository institutions, meaning that ones that are already under the FDIC umbrella, I believe, um, as long as those are willing to pledge treasuries, debt, mortgage-backed securities, and qualifying assets. And we'll get into those qualifying assets. I have the, I have the list. Um, and then it's, there's a backstop of $25 billion here, which they mentioned, which is kind of odd. And I'm, I'm still trying to look into this because they, they have the ability to probably pump about, 
I, I've heard numbers as much as like one to two trillion. So why they would call out this 25 billion from the exchange stabilization fund as a backstop, I don't know. I mean, is this frosting on the cake, right? Try to make you feel like, hey, here's a big dollar amount that we already got pledged. But it, it's also left pocket, right pocket, you know, not for nothing. It's kind of like, um, you know, you're telling me you're going to back up this program with, with money from another program you run. Well, you don't need to tell me that, but they, they felt they, they needed to. And I'm curious as to why, because it gets mentioned uh, quite frequently. Um, recommendations from the boards, blah, 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 approved. And this talks about some of the specific banks. The board's carefully monitoring developments in financial markets, which is interesting because what they're saying here is that, you know, what do they mean by monitoring developments in financial markets? Well, primarily the stock market. So they're watching this this, this metric, right? This this um, this meter of of confidence in banking, and also realized losses. You know, as these banks, these regional banks, have to sell off long paper at losses, that that should hit the stock price. And so people looking at regional bank stocks are probably already. This is, you know, this is already two weeks ago, right? So, so there are experts in bank equities that know what the bank's balance sheet looks like, how that match funding lines up. Watch the other video for that discussion. Um, and then they're going, hey, you know what? If, if the liabilities are a year less in duration than what they were, uh, how much would the realized losses be for that regional bank? What would the hit to the stock price be? That's going to be my new target figure. So, so the board is basically saying, hey, we're watching the stock market too. Um, and they're also looking at the capital and liquidity positions of the banking system. Now, the uh, I agree with the Fed here. The, the Fed talks about the fact that there's resiliency and there's this and that. Absolutely, absolutely. This is not a hundred years ago um, when when you know the government really didn't have the ability per se or the tools to really backstop banks. The ability to like pump money into any one of these and play whack-a-mole with these regional banks as they go sideways completely within the capability of the federal government. Um, what's interesting here, though, is that there, there is some perverse incentives uh, here, because in essence, you've now told all these regional banks, especially the ones that are publicly traded, because the publicly traded ones are the ones whose stock prices are going to reflect those unrealized losses uh, and, and are going to have the fastest runs, right? Because you're going to see your bank on the news and be like, oh, Sorry, you know, let's let's get our money out of there. So so there's definitely um, a, a little bit of difference in, in how publicly traded banks and privately uh, held banks um, are going to be affected by this these market conditions. Um, and I really feel like the Fed is putting this high profile new program in place, in essence, to to sort of counteract. Um, the the perception that that these banks are not going to be able to pay their depositors back. So rather than the Fed just expanding an existing program, they're going out and saying, hey, we have a new program to solve this specific issue. So it's a little bit of marketing, a little bit of marketing. Remember, the cash is all coming from the same place, right? The cash is all being printed by some machines, the Franklin Mint, so um, or the Bureau of Printing and Engraving. Sorry, the, I think the Mint does the coins. So here's the report uh, on this. So let's just check our dates here. So the press release on the 12th, here's a report to Congress. Unanimous vote, of course, right? Because who's going to vote against uh, saving the banks? Um makes funding eligible. We saw that before. Under the BTF, each reserve bank will lend, meaning, so so these are the 12, uh, you know, regional feds are all going to be ma managing their own program. Uh, recent events have resulted in the stress to certain banks, right? So, so the Fed is saying not every bank is stressed, just certain ones. Um, and that the unusual circumstances, now they're calling it unusual, but you raise the rates. So I don't know how unusual it is, but that's fine. They, they, they want to, you know, of course, the Fed is trying to paint themselves in the best light, especially to Congress, right? Because Congress is the one writing their check uh, that they're like, oh, look, Congress, this is just some unusual circumstance happening. Really what it is, not for nothing, is that the Fed did not think that destroying the venture capital and private equity markets would have not only a, a detrimental effect on 
those funds, but also the banks at where those funds bank and also where the startups also bank. Um, so here are the basic terms, right? And we're going to go through the terms next, but basically eligible, any U.S. federally insured depository station. There you go. So you remember I said uh, we want to see what it means. So you have to already be part of the FDIC program. So if you're a bank and there's plenty of banks in the U.S. that are not FDIC insured or credit unions or what have you, you basically they're saying you're on your own. So that that's an unfortunate, and it would be interesting to see if there are publicly traded non-FDIC insured banks and how they're coping with this. Um, also, a U.S. branch of a foreign bank that's also eligible. So the FDIC does here uh, or here what what they're saying is that look, you may not be you may not fall under the FDIC rules, but you might be eligible as a U.S. branch of a foreign bank to have access to the capital. Also, again, this is on that the Fed's expectation that these depositors are going to leave. Now remember, runs don't take days. They take weeks. It, you, you know, the people have to think about the consequences of, first off, do they have a, you know, if you're a company and, you, and you're at a regional bank, do you have a, a bank account that represents a marketed improvement in the risk to your capital? Can you go upstream? And then once you get through that process, are, are those upstream banks choking on applications right now. Um, and then as soon as that account is approved, does the money all head over there or does, a, does it go in dribs and drabs as payroll gets set up? So bank runs and shifting of assets from safe banks to safer banks um, is not something that happens quickly, especially because we're not talking about retail. We're really talking about regional banks that have a disproportionate exposure to businesses and uh, other kind of commercial enterprises. So, so that that to me is really like the canary in the coal mine. I'm not saying it's the end of the world. These things, it might heal itself. Like right, there's there's no there's there's no telling how long or pervasive the run's going to be. I will say, though, that once it's on your mind and we're in the first quarter, um, it, it becomes a to-do. And, and so this, the, the issue for a lot of regional banks is that the, the activity and the action of the Fed here uh, and what happened with Silicon Valley and the other S banks is that you know, the, the CFOs and the controllers and the treasurers at these companies were not thinking about who they were banking with, generally speaking. They, they just kind of go, yeah, this, we got other problems to deal with. We got reports, we got filings, we have payroll, we have revenue we got to make. Banking is is something that that was, a you know, not on the list of things to be concerned about. But once that becomes, once that awareness is raised and the discussion is happening, um, you also have sales, right? You got sales from the big banks going to these customers and being like, hey, you're at you know, Jane regional savings, well, you know, maybe you should think about cutting off a piece and at least opening up an account at Chase or Bank of America or Wells Fargo and, uh, and, and just, you know, have it available. You just have it available. And then, oh, by the way, once you're available, be like, hey, look, we're going to give you 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, 10,000 bucks if you move your whole payroll over. So these regional banks are really, really under a lot of stress and attack, not only from just the, the mindset and the mentality of people being like, oh, oh no, I need to go to a safer bank. But there's obviously active marketing from the bigs to take share away from those small guys. And here, um, this program, which allows banks to borrow, right? They can borrow for up to one year against eligible collateral, right? So if you're a bank and you're part of the FDIC insured network, you can borrow for up to one year against eligible collateral that the Fed already accepts. And we'll go through that list. The size of the advance is limited to the value of the eligible collateral pledged by the eligible borrower. Now, that is interesting in and of itself, because as it stands today, if you want to borrow from the Fed against eligible collateral, that amount is typically capped at 70, 80 cents. It's, you can't borrow 100% against the value of the collateral because, again, if the value of the collateral drops, now, of course, now the Fed is exposed, right? The government's exposed because the collateral they're holding is less than the loan that they've made to the bank. So this is clearly a new era. This is the Fed saying you can borrow up to the value of the eligible collateral. Advances will be made available for a term of up to one year. So, you know, listen, I'll give you the money now, but in a year, you got to give it back to me 
plus interest. And the rate that they're going to charge is the overnight index swap rate, which is going to be a very small interest amount, plus 10 basis points. Why plus 10 basis points? Probably because they just wanted to, you know, put a little sugar on it. But I, I mean, it's still not that they're giving the money away. Um, you can borrow money for a year at an overnight rate, plus 10 basis points. It's, it's nothing. It's free money. And the rate is fixed on the day the advance is made. So even if the Fed keeps right raising rates, which would of course raise the overnight rate, the Fed's like, like, hey, get in, get in, get in now, you know, borrow now and, and you're good to go. No fees associated with borrowing, right? So again, free money. Wouldn't this be great if we could borrow this? Yeah, I'll, I'll take free money for a year. I'll figure out a way to, to get, get you paid back. Um, and and this is the beauty, right? This is like, you know, when they talk about the money machine going burr, the collateral valuation will be par value. Okay, so remember what I just said. Typically, you could borrow from the Fed at like 70 to 80 cents on the dollar so that the Fed would have a little bit of cushion in case the value of the collateral dropped. Here, they're saying, don't worry what it's worth. We're going to take that collateral at par value, uh, <laughs> which means that that... Even if the collateral that if if the so so you, let's take a real world example. So you're a regional bank. Um, your deposits are starting to accelerate, and you're like, oh no, I need to shorten the duration of my assets so that I have the cash to pay back my uh, depositors. So you look and you say, oh, I got a lot of ten year, twenty or thirty year paper. Okay, it could be in uh, grade, you know, investment grade uh, fannies and GSE bonds, treasuries. All it's good paper. It's just very long term, um, and and because you have it, and interest rates are rising, odds are that paper is is kind of underwater. So maybe two years ago, you put in a hundred million dollars into um, you know ten year treasuries or some some long or thirty year Fannie Mae, and now it's two years later, and you're like okay, we need this cash to pay back our depositors. Before this program was announced, what the bank would do is they would just go to the market and they would sell those the, that 30-year paper. And they would be selling it at a loss in these market conditions because rates have gone up. So that paper that they're holding that's at a fixed lower rate is obviously worth less than par uh, so that the yield uh, is the equivalent to what you know, rates on new paper uh, issued today are that. That's how it works. Is that is that the the value of your long term note drops um, as interest rates in the market rise, so that the effective yield of that bond, uh, meaning whatever the coupon is, plus the the value of the discount represented as a percentage, that effective yield is at par with the market. And they're saying here we're going to treat everything with uh, face value as par value. So if um, you got 100 million in in 30 year GSEs, we're going to lend you 100 million. Okay, even though that that 100 million in in GSE government sponsored entity paper might be worth only 97 cents on the dollar, 95 cents on the dollar, they're going to treat it here as 100, and you could borrow up to that amount, and you're going to pay very nominal interest. I mean, this is just the golden calf right here. Uh, and I believe that's correct. And if, if if I'm mistaken as to how I'm interpreting it, please put it in the comments. I should put the disclaimer, not a lawyer, uh, not a tax specialist. Um, these are my opinions alone, not the opinions of any uh, my company or uh, any company or anything that I'm affiliated with. These are just my opinions. So, so the Fed is saying, look, you can borrow basically face value, against face value, 100%. You can prepay at any time, no penalty. Um, but uh, the recourse is maybe above the pledge value of the collateral to, to the borrower. So you, you have 100 million in underwater long-term bonds. You borrow 100 million, but you get do get charged interest. So your interest is a little bit higher. Um, they're basically saying that the recourse is that they can come after the other assets that you didn't pledge um, in order to get paid back. They expect the program to run about a year. Uh, and at that point, they're going to terminate it. Now, it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. Because again, if, you've, if you're a bank and you've borrowed against those treasuries and interest rates are still high, then how do you pay back the loan, 
right? All you've done is kick the problem down the road a year. The bank would still have to effectively kind of sell the collateral and then some to pay back the loan. Remember, $100 million, you're a bank. You had invested a few years ago $100 million into 30-year Fannie Mae securities. You wanted to sell that or you were going to sell that to pay back your depositors, but because rates have gone up, this $100 million is only worth $95 million. Well, you're not going to sell it and realize the loss and the hits equity and blah, blah, blah. You're going to go to this program. You borrow the $100 million. It's a year later, right? Interest rates are still elevated. So, so that bond is maybe worth $93 million or $92 million, depends on how high rates go. So now you, you have two choices, right? And, and if the Fed doesn't ex, ex, extend this program, now you're sitting here going, okay, um, where am I going to get the money? I got to sell, I got to sell the collateral, right? So they sell the collateral, then they got to sell other collateral they have that's also at a loss just to pay back the government loan. And all of a sudden that hit, that hit goes right to equity. The stock prices drop and you're right back where we are just one year later. That's the crazy part here, right? It's a one-year loan. How do you get out from under this? The only way I see you getting out from under this is if interest rates drop so precipitously that the collateral actually increases in value above, you know, the par value of the of the note, and um, you, you know, maybe maybe the bank ends up making money or breaking even, uh, or at least covering the interest. But why would interest rates be lower in a year? You, you know what I mean? Like the Fed's cranking the rates up in order to like stop inflation and and these kind of uh, inf- deflationary. Um, tactics take 18 months to two years to work their way through the system. So my two cents, this is this is just as dangerous a play. Um, no requirements, cost to taxpayer. Uh, the board does not expect this time the result in losses to the Fed Reserve or the taxpayer. So, so basically the Fed's saying, look, we have the cash and we don't think we're going to need anything from taxpayers. Believe me, taxpayers get hit in in plenty of other ways. Um, and then this is only four days after the program started, and already there was about 12 billion drawn against 16 billion in pledged collateral, which I wonder if that is because maybe some of these early draws, they weren't lending up, you know, 100 cents on the dollar. Uh, or is it possible that um, folks that have participated in the program have kind of over pledged? Uh, knowing that they're going to have to go back to the well. And so like, yeah, let's just pledge more. And then that way we, you know, it's still ours. We're just pledging it as collateral so that we can draw if if uh, runs happen. And then the interest already is 662,000 bucks in four days. So that is not a small number. Okay, good. So you got it. One-year program, FDIC insured banks and foreign banks, collateral. It's a one-year loan at some really little tiny, tiny interest rate plus 10 bips. Um, there's eligible collateral requirements, but they're they're treating the collateral at par uh, for uh, what the, what they can borrow against. So that's uh, that's pretty incredible. Okay, cool. So uh, if you go to the Fed's website, it talks about some of the things. There's terms and conditions, FAQs. That's the report. There's all the stuff I clicked on to see it, right? And so the the it's to assure banks have the ability to meet the needs of all their depositors, which I love. They say the needs of their depositors. They really mean withdrawals. Here are the terms itself. Okay. Um, to provide liquidity to depository institutions. It's really interesting that they use these terms because, again, the banks have the liquidity. Even this is grade A paper. This is good paper. They have the liquidity. They're just going to be taking losses on the liquidation of those assets. At some point, they run out of liquidity, but but that happens when you, you know, if if all the withdrawals... um, from the deposits and, and the CDs and stuff and people not re-upping, that has to cut so deep for a bank to literally not have the cash to pay it back. Really what the Fed's doing here is they're protecting equity losses because that's what happens is that when the bank sells that long paper at a loss, um, they get the cash, right? Pay back their depositors, but then they got to realize those unrealized losses. And when they report those unrealized losses as realized losses, the hit's going to go to equity. And then, you know, it, it it doesn't start hitting the the bank, the 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 liability part 
of the bank's balance sheet until all that equity is is sucked out. So, but that's important because again, for publicly traded banks, people see the equity number and they equate the equity number to safety. You know, a bank that has a, a pennies worth of equity still has enough assets to cover its liabilities. You know, buy one penny. Um, but I, again, this is this is some gamesmanship. It really, it really is uh, fascinating. I mean, I can't help. It's it's frightening to a certain respect, but in 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 that sort of like, there's a meteor coming and you can't do anything about it. So you're like, oh, let's just see how people react. Um, okay, borrow el el eligibility. We cover that eligible collateral. We're going to talk about it. Uh, limited to the value of the eligible collateral. The rate, we saw that at par, margin 100%, no prepay, advance credit. The Department of the Treasury will provide credit protection. Um, but but again, see, credit protection at $25 billion, I really want to find out why that matters, considering that they have these trillions at their, uh, at their disposal. Okay, and then, of course, it's one year. Fine, we've been through that. So here's the FAQs, and we're going to zip through this. Why did they do this? We could guess how will it work, basically using the same functions that they do today, just different, you know, different treatment of the assets uh, and liabilities. Who can participate? We saw this. Are depository institutions that are eligible for secondary credit eligible? No. So that's a question here is that what what differentiates that? Like, are there non-FDIC insured banks that might be eligible for secondary credit? Um, that they're they're just kind of saying, hey, I know you can get to to us through the secondary market, but you're not FDIC shirt, so you're out. Non-depository, no, right? So here, right here, this is a big question: is how much? What do the balance sheets look like for all of sevens and eights in the world? Um, the standard template for the discount window. Now we talked about this before years ago about how a lot of smaller banks that are FDIC insured have access to these programs, but don't use them because there are compliance and oversight and it's just, and, and costs, you know, at the end of the day, it's still a person that's to push buttons, make phone calls, et cetera, that don't take advantage of these programs. And instead uh, a regional bank will use a larger bank as actually its backstop. So the question becomes, are larger banks going to backstop, not buy out, the backstop or fund the regional banks at maybe uh, the overnight plus 15 bips. And then if the larger bank needs that money, they go, hey, I'm going to go borrow it, uh, you know, overnight plus 10 bips. And all of a sudden these large banks, are large banks going to start arbitraging this product um, to backstop regionals and maybe even some non-FDIC insured banks? Ooh, that is interesting. And I, I haven't heard anybody talking about that yet, but you know, I, I had a professor once, Chip Rusher, right? God bless this guy. And if you, if you find him, I think he's at TCU or Arizona now. He once worked at a bank and he told me how when he was a young uh, bank uh, worker, how he like arbitraged the discount window. <laughs> this is, you know, Chip, if you're listening, think of the truck you could drive through this and, and just print money for your bank. Um, all right, eligible collateral we'll get into. How does the requirement for a borrower to have owned a security? So this is talking about like, do they really have the portfolio? Oh, here are some of the examples that, that are that are eligible. Uh, direct obligations from the treasury, from Farmer Mac, FHLB, Freddie, Fannie, FICO, interesting, Ginny, Revco, um, SLMA, and the TVA, love the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, bonds. And then, of course, mortgage-backed securities that are issued or fully guaranteed by Ginny, Freddie, and Fannie are okay. Now, what's interesting here is that private private label securitizations are not included in this, even if they are highly graded. So you will have a problem where a number of, again, these regional banks may not, you know, they're looking for another couple of BIPs, right? Like, I need 10 BIPs. If I can find 10 BIPs, 20 BIPs, how am I going to find that that return on these assets that I've invested in? Well, maybe I go to a private label and I sit in a AAA in a private label, as opposed to going to a GSE bond where I'm going to get like you know I'm going to get slightly tighter uh, spreads uh, on that paper because it is backed by you know the GSE and the full faith and credit of the of the government. Um, those are excluded. So so you could have a regional bank with with a decent amount of equity 
doesn't have any kind of whiz bang product. They're facing they're facing competitive pressure. They're, they're facing the psychology of their business customers already thinking about going now that it's on their radar. Those entities that bank with them are being marketed by the bigs because the bigs don't care, right? Do you think Chase cares if if a thousand banks die? <laughs> come on, come on, right? Like this is America. This is what we do. So you have the regional bank. It's it's commercial customers are freaking out. Then you have the 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 banks, the big banks, marketing to them, right? So 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 now you have a run on deposits, and that regional bank is going, okay, uh, we got to pay these deposit backs. How are we going to do this? Oh, and our stock's publicly traded, and 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 the the ALCO committee, the asset liability committee goes, hey, let's let's sell some of our long term paper to fund these deposits. And go to the window. Um, and you know, of course, then you have those realized losses and the, and the hit to equity. So, so this is actually you could probably take every bank of the five thousand in the United States, break them into these chunks, um, and and almost like circle and go, okay, these guys are the ones that are going to get hit the hardest. Middle America, you know, the regional bank in Missouri, you know, four hundred miles uh, west of uh, St. Louis, you know, something like that. Uh, and I, I hope I'm, I'm getting the cardinal directions right, but you, you know that regional bank that that uh, is does qualify, but maybe they don't have the assets that qualify, or they don't have the infrastructure to go to the 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 uh, open market, um, uh, the open window. So still very very challenging. Payments on pledged collateral, uh, collateral. If your institution is already eligible, collateral pledged. Uh, yes. So so basically, if you're already using the 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 discount window then you're fine. Um, some basic mechanics, fees, no fees, rates fixed, yes. There'll be updates at the discount window. So clearly they're just leveraging the, the knobs on, on that program. Uh, you know, they forked their open uh, discount window program. Uh, and then of course, disclosures. Okay, good. So, so kind of more of the same. And the last piece here is let's, let's look at the collateral again. And this is, this is again, where the rubber's going to hit the road, your regional bank, some portion of your long-term assets are probably not in these qualified assets, but if you, if, if they are, this is what you can use to, to go um, borrow again, hundred percent, you know, right, right there. Uh, you know, U.S. treasuries, bills, bonds, strips, uh, government sponsored entities. That's the Fannie Freddie stuff. This is interesting. AAA to A rated uh, foreign government debt. So th this is stuff. You know, I remember seeing this stuff in pension funds. This is very. This is this is like the kind of paper that pensions are all in. This high quality uh, foreign and domestic uh, bonds and notes. Interesting that you can go down to triple B on on the corporates. But it looks like there's obviously a limit to the amount. Uh, is this the, the well, that this program says 100%. So this must be the the discount window, how much you can borrow against it. They're saying that you can borrow currently, uh, depending on the risk, right, um, or the time. So one year, three to five year, five to 10, greater than 10. So, so basically right now, this looks like the riskiest bucket so far. So triple B corporates, you can borrow long-term on the discount window, 85 cents on the dollar. That's now 100. That's now 100, right? The government is basically saying that, yeah, we wanted to build in some cushion for drops in value, but boom. And again, as the, the Fed continues to raise rates to, to stave inflation, that's going to make the value even worse uh, of, those, of that collateral. Um, anything else that's real spicy? What is this? Triple A CLOs. Look at this right now. 70, 64. Ooh, this is the spicy stuff because this is all of this stuff is now eligible for at a hundred percent. We're getting deep in it. And the RMBS is 59%. Boom. So if so, if you're a bank, this is where, and again, I don't want to give any, this isn't an advice. So if you're a banker watching this, do not gamble with your customer's money. Do not gamble with my money if I bank with you. But not for nothing, if you know the discount window here, if the disc, if the discount window is now going to accept a hundred percent of the par value of the triple B MBS versus a fifty nine percent under normal circumstances, load up on this. Load up on that paper. You know, load up on the triple B. Borrow borrow against it for a year at nothing rates and go. 
you know, go to town, go to town, go take on other, you know, other liabilities um, or, or just, you know, take the funds you get back from borrowing against it. Nothing in those rules, nothing in the rules says that you have to use the fund. Let, let me just double check. Blah, blah, blah. It just says you have to have a master account. You can initiate in advance. How does the requirement for a borrower to have owned a security? Nope. This is all about the borrowers, but there's nothing in here about the use of proceeds. I don't think so. The program offers loans of up to one year in length. The open market, blah, blah, blah. These assets will be valued apart. So yeah. So nothing in here says I got to use the money that I'm borrowing just to cover my deposits. So this is a total opportunity for craziness. Uh, but, you know, listen, this is, you know, Janet's smarter than me. Her husband's Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, he's smarter than me. The, uh, the whole the whole lot of them. OK, so. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to wrap it up. So, um, <laughs> wow. So the bank uh, term did I, should I just get, get it right here. Bank term funding program um, is an expansion of the existing discount window program that the Fed offers. In this case, they're allowing banks to borrow for a year at very low interest rates up to par value of these longer term securities. So it stops the regionals from, you know, realizing those unrealized losses uh, and, and in an effort to, to kind of reinstall confidence into the system. Um, I have obviously, if you've, you've listened to this <laughs> presentation, I obviously have my opinions about how well this is going to work. Um, I, I see a lot of <laughs> big banks using this program to make more money uh, to arbit. Uh, I see the regionals using this to sort of like stave off a, a little bit of the inevitable. Um, my hope would be maybe they take some of the money from the program and use it to like incentivize their commercial clients to stay on um, because now, the, you know, the antenna's up. Um, but either way, like, look, uh, let, let me try to put some positive spin on this for a sec. Um, kudos to Janet and the Federal Reserve uh, for, you know, and, and really, and Powell, but, you know, I, I know Janet and Yellen is really driving a lot of this. Um, kudos to them for trying to um, address what they felt was the crux of the concern, the ability for banks to pay their depositors. Like that's the, that's the problem that they felt they needed to solve. Um, so good on them for doing something. And I think that's really all I can say about it. Good on them for doing something. But then beyond that, um, man. So, all right. Well, look, good luck to everyone. Thanks for taking the time. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed this week's uh, program. Again, Howard Krieger, CEO of Federal Reserve. Be sure to like and subscribe to uh, this channel below. And, um, you know, you guys keep watching. I'll keep, keep making them. Take care and have a great rest of your week.